First Corinthians chapter four, or First Thessalonians chapter four. The title of the message today is "Sexuality and Dating." Sexual purity. Uh, as Pastor Terry talked last year and spoke into the 2014, he said, "This is to be the year of the family." And so I've endeavored to honor Pastor Terry and honor what he spoke into this year. And with the conference that's coming up for the singles, I began to think, and I have been thinking for many weeks now, Lord, what can I speak to young people or people who are single, who uh, maybe have been divorced, widowed? Um, So I'm not going to be able to hit all the topics that I would like to on this because of just the time that we have, but I do believe that I've got some relevant things to share with you this morning that will help you that are single, you that want to be married, you that want to remarry, and I also believe it's going to empower parents, it's going to empower us as individuals to be able to give good information and to tell people, this is what the Word says about your sexuality, not what the culture says. Because I can tell you what the culture says does not line up with this. Uh, It does not line up with it. So let's look at this today in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 1 through 8. It says this, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you here this morning want to know how to live and that your life will please God? That's probably everybody. So it says, how to live in, ple- uh, to ple- in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and we urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will. It is God's will. And I don't know for how many years that I prayed the prayer, Lord, what is the will, what is your will for my life? What is God's will for my life? What do you want me to do with my life? And since being in ministry, I've talked to many teenagers, many people that have said, you know, Pastor Mark, I just want to know what the will of God is for my life. Well, it's about to tell you right here because it says it is God's will that you should be, number one, sanctified. Sanctified is a big word that means set apart. It means you're not, you're not doing what everybody else does. You set yourself apart. Number two, that you should avoid sexual immorality. And number three, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in a passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. Now, he's writing to Christians. Y'all do know that the Bible was written to the church, per se, right? It's not written to the world, it's written to us. So, and he says, and that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, listen, he who rejects this instruction, the first seven verses, does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now, let me tell you. That is a mouthful right there. Verses 1 through 8, there's a whole lot of shaking going on right there. Because of what all Paul is is explaining to them. And like I said, there's there's a lot to be said on this topic. There's so much about how we date in America that is not biblical. And I don't have time to go into that today. But I will say this, I do believe dating sets us up for failure. I didn't figure I'd get a lot of amens on that, and that's okay. Um, especially for those that are dating right now. It's like, I'm not saying, I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> so I realize that I'm probably going to have to take a Wednesday, a Wednesday, some Wednesdays, and do a series on teaching about sexuality and dating, courtship, the things, because let me, I'm just going to be really, this is going to be a message that's kind of in your face today. It's in my face. It's going to be in your face. Um, You know, to say that our culture is sexually overcharged is an understatement. Because the world knows sex sells. In America, it's a billion and billion and billion dollar industry. 
And so it's, in, it's just in front of us at all times. You can't go stand in the line at Walmart while you don't have the, the, the swimsuit sports illustrated edition right there. Kim Kardashian and all the Dashians. <laughs> and all the things. That, so, I mean, you literally, as a guy, you have to stand in line like with blinders on, speaking in tongues, being holy. <laughs> Dropping to your knees and getting saved again. Getting up looking. Gah! Let's just get holy again. Because it's, it's just everywhere around you. Everywhere. You're, you're sitting there and you're watching TV. And as, and as a guy, God made us, we're, we're very much sight oriented. And I mean, you're sitting there, you've been watching the, the, the football game or some, some sports or some movie. And all of a sudden, something comes on and there's just this woman that, you know, has been made by God, and he did a very good job when he made her. <laughs> or America has helped her look better. And you're just like, Lord, does it ever stop? So I, I need to tell you, no, it doesn't. It doesn't ever stop because the enemy never... This is both bad news and good news. The enemy never stops. You say, well, what's good about that? So that you can know who your enemy is and know that you're going to have to fight at all times. Sexual perversion is how Satan robs people of their destiny. Because when people get off into sexual promiscuity and do things that they shouldn't be doing, it has robbed govern, government officials of their place and the, the respect that they have. It has robbed coaches. I remember reading about one of the coaches from my high school. He wasn't a coach when I was there, but he ended up having a, a, an adulterous um, relationship with one of the teachers there, and they both had to get you know, fired from that position. And it's really funny how the culture has, ha, makes it sound so much better by calling it an affair. Oh, I had an affair. Instead of going, I'm an adulterer. And I committed adultery. So the enemy takes the culture and takes the words that are even in the Scripture and tries to make it sound like it's okay. It's like saying a liar has just a really extreme imagination. But the Bible says that's a liar. And y'all know where liars go. Washington, D.C. I didn't know if y'all knew that or not. So, ah, come on, come on. I've got to lighten this up a little bit. Not all of them, not all of them, so. But you, you know of the stories of pastors and ministers that have gotten, gotten into sexual uh, circumstances and affairs and adultery, and they've ruined their life. They've ruined the ministry, they've ruined their, their family's life, their wife has to he he hold their head in shame, uh, their kids, you know, they don't want to go back to the same school that they had been in. And they never get back, it seems, to the place where they once were because of what they've done. And then you find husbands and wives who end up having these adulterous relationships. And it destroys their marriage, it destroys their kids, and then their kids have to live in that. So, uh, uh, adultery, there's pornography, uh, it's everywhere, it's not just... You know, in the little peep shows from years ago, you can, magazines, it's on, the, it's on your phone, it's, 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 it's everywhere. We don't live in an innocent culture anymore. It's very unfortunate. I, I remember when I was introduced to the terminology of sex and pornography, I was about 10 years old, my brother was 8, my dad managed a, 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 a hotel down in Port Lavaca. And uh, it was the summer, we were there, and one of his teenage employees who worked there on the, in the building and the grounds took Jeff and I into this, this motel room and somehow had some stuff hooked up and uh, showed us that, showed us the magazine, and then propositioned us to be able to have sex with his girlfriend for $5. Do you know how much $5 is in 1970 to a five-year-old? So first I'm like, well, I don't want to have sex. I don't know what it is. I didn't tell him that. <laughs> and then I said, it sounds way too expensive. It's just way too expensive. Because, man, back then you could buy a ton of ices at 7-Eleven for five bucks. 
That's like sugar rush high. Those big pixie sticks, just turning it up. Five dollars. I'm not, no, sex, no. 7-Eleven, dude. Going to 7-Eleven. So I, I, remember, I remember vividly that taking place in my life. And that's back in the, in, the, in the early 1970s. So we have fourth graders now and younger who are learning about sex. And the trash that parents let their kids watch on TV and movies that they rent. And I'm thinking, wh- where is the sanity uh, uh, of this? And now we've got 16-year-olds who are sex experts. They're telling your kids, this is what you do and this is how you do it. I remember learning about the, act- the actual sexual act in sixth grade in my music class in the back of the class with some promiscuous classmates. Now, we weren't doing anything there. They were just talking about it. I just, uh, but we were, I remember we were in music class back in the corner, and there was a, some downtime, and they started talking and graphically describing the sexual act. And I'm a sixth grader, and, and I, didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know about that. Instead of texting today, they're sexting. They're sending inappropriate pictures and inappropriate videos to one another, showing things they shouldn't be showing. Matter of fact, I had a teacher come up to me after the first service and say, man, God bless you for talking about this because I have multiple young ladies who come up who have sent these pictures and sent these texts, and now they are, they are just, their, their whole life is destroyed because this boy who they thought it would be cool to send it to, he sent it to everybody. So there's perversion, there's promiscuity. It's like a sexual dam has been broken here in America. The movies don't help. Magazines don't help. Music is doing it. TV shows. They're telling our kids and they're selling sex to our kids. And if the church does not stand up and draw the line and say, this is what the Word says versus what the world says, then the world is going to invade the Word, the church, and the church is going to look just like the world. And I'm just going to tell you, that ain't happening on my watch. It may happen somewhere else, but it's not happening on my watch. So some would say that, you know, talking about sex, that should be left to the parents. And I completely agree. It should be the parents that's telling them. But it's my job as a pastor to make sure that they get the right information so that when they do talk to them, they can talk to them straight up and they can talk to them biblically and they can do it the right way. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about sex. But the church, on the other hand, says nothing and then we're having lives being destroyed. When we have 13-year-olds having babies and they're in the church, we have a problem, Houston. We have a very large problem. So, I don't know if you've ever read the book called The Song of Solomon. It's in, the, it's in, the, it's in the, the Bible. Hebrew boys are not allowed to read this until they turn 13. Because the book is pretty sexually charged. It's a, it's a book that some people feel is an allegory as far as how God loves the church. And then there are some other interpretations. And then there's the one where it says, look... This is a guy writing about the love and the passion that he had for a woman, and he's, an expre- he's expressing it, and this shows the way that it really needs to be and, 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 and how that love can be for a man and for a woman. And the, the Scripture says in Song, and so- Song of Solomon, do not stir or awaken love until it's time. Because let me tell you, if you open up that box before you're supposed to, it's hard to get the top back on. Now, hopefully I don't have to be any more graphic than that. Hopefully everybody's like, no, we got you. We, we, we're good, Pastor Mark. We understand. But we're created sexual beings. We were created as sexual beings. And let me tell you something, whether you know this or not, everybody got here by sex. Now, I know for some of us, when we think about our parents doing that, we're like, oh, Jesus. Oh. Shake it off. Shake it off. No, no. 
Is that not reality? That's the truth. So, but in this Song of Solomon, you know, he, he would say things like, you, when he was talking to um, the woman, he said, your eyes are like dove's eyes. He said, your hair is like a flock of goats going down Mount Gilead. Your neck is like the Tower of David. And, you know, today that means absolutely nothing. It's like, you throw that out there right now and they'll be like. What? You know, it's not like the one that I threw out a few months ago when we were talking about stuff. And I said, you know, when you're, you're with somebody and you said, did it hurt when you fell from heaven? And I told Teresa, no, I, I landed on my feet. I'm fine. <laughs> oh, you're kind to of laugh. You're kind to of laugh. But let me say this. Sex is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. But it, has, it comes with a warning label that says only open after marriage. Sex is a gift from God. But it has a warning label and it says only open after after marriage second thing is is getting to marriage getting to the marriage altar pure is the goal for every parent for their child that should be your goal parents so that means you're going to have to be a parent which means you're going to have to know their friends you're going to have to know where they're going you're going to have to check their phone you're going to have to look at their email you're going to have to be in their business you're going to have to do that you're going to have to say things like, I don't really particularly care for that person. There's something not right because the Holy Spirit in you says that that person is not right. You can't go out on a date with him. You can't go out on a date with her. No, you're not going to hang out with those people. That's what parents are supposed to say. Parents are supposed to know what's going on in their life. And matter of fact, the, the, the teacher that told me about, that thanked me for the message, she said, all of these girls are mad at their parents because their parents did not stop them and were not involved in their life enough to look at their phone and say, you're not doing this. That's coming from, that's coming from the teenagers. And the third thing is, like all good gifts that come from God, Satan will pervert and corrupt it. And he has perverted and corrupted sex. There's three views. There's the world's view, which says sex is a god. And the world's view about sex is I don't want to have any boundaries or consequences. In other words, no moral judgments. I want to be, have it placed on me. That's the world's view. The, the religion's view is this. It says sex is not healthy. Sex is dirty. It's unclean. It's not pure. It's not something to be enjoyed. I listened to uh, a pastor friend of mine. He talked about the, the denomination that he was raised in that... They actually taught within their curriculum to tell the women not to enjoy sex because it would encourage your husband to want to have more sex. I'd have burned that book. Once I read that, that thing would have been all in flames. And we would find another church. <laughs> but then there's God's view found in Hebrews 13 and 4, which says marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed is to be kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer, and he will judge all the sexually immoral. One of the scriptures, or that same scripture out of the Message Bible says this, Honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between a wife and a husband. God draws a firm line against casual and illicit sex. God's view of sex is this. Outside of marriage, it is a sin. Period. End of discussion. It's, it's, it's sin. Inside of marriage, it's holy and wonderful. And how many of you remember a show years ago, Good Times with J.J. Walker? And his deal was, it's dino might. That's what sex is in marriage. Now, listen, y'all are a lot stuffier than the first service. Y'all just need to kind of just, it's all right. 
I'm not going to say anything crude. I'm not going to say anything that's going to be vulgar or nasty. But I am going to tell you what the Word says. So, you probably didn't get up this morning praying about coming to church. And the Lord just drop it on you and say, I believe He's going to talk about sexuality and dating today. I believe I'll go for that. But with our conference that's coming up this Friday and Saturday, our, our single people, teenagers, young adults, divorcees and widowers, need to know what the Word says about this topic. The church needs to have a stance. And the stance is the Word of God. I don't care if people tell me all day long, Pastor Mark, everybody's having sex before marriage. If you're a part of me, you're not. You're not going to do that. Not, not if I have anything. Now, I can't be around you 24-7. But don't do that. Don't destroy your life for a few moments of pleasure. I'm not, I'm, li- listen to me. If you're single, don't you go to hell because of someone else. Don't make a decision that puts you in a place that jeopardizes your life for eternity. Well, I just love her. Oh, I, Pastor Mark, I love him. You know, the world, the world teaches us that we can fall in love and then we can fall out of love. The Bible doesn't teach that we fall out of love. The Bible teaches that we make a decision to love. I make a decision to love my wife. I make a decision to love my kids. I make a decision. Now, yes, as I'm longer with them and around them, that love grows and it, and it does become emotional. But when we make judgments and we do decisions out of emotions, it's not good. It's not a good place to be. So that's what God's view is. Let, let me say, say this to you. If you relate to fire wrong, fire can burn you. Fire can kill you. But if you relate to fire right, it cooks your food. It warms your house. I mean, when you're cold, you can be warm. If you relate to water wrong, water can drown you. Water out, out, outside of its, what it's supposed to do can, can cause flooding and kill many people. But uh, if you relate to water right, it's refreshing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's, that's good for you. And what makes fire and water work correctly is something that's called boundaries. So when you relate to sex improperly, it can kill you. Literally. It can kill you. But if you relate to to sex properly, it's wonderful and it creates life. And just like fire and water, the way that sex works properly is within boundaries. And these define what are the boundaries. Before marriage, you're out of bounds. In marriage, you're in bounds. Amen. You people, y'all are something. There's, I, I, I know there's, there's some of you sitting out there going, I've never heard this topic. I think it's great, but I know if I clap, people are going to think I'm a weird. <laughs> and, and you're not. 1 Thessalonians 4.8 states, When you reject purity in your sexual life, you are rejecting God. Now that's pretty strong. But that's what the Word says. When we, re- when we reject sexual purity in our lives, we are rejecting God. And let me tell you, sex outside of marriage dishonors your parents, dishonors God, dishonors you your body and it dishonors your eventual mate and let me tell you virginity is not a bad word you are not weird you are not strange and there's not something wrong with you if you're sitting in this room today and you are a virgin matter of fact we ought to applaud you and we ought to lift you up and say god bless you and thank you for standing on that You don't want to give that away to just anybody. That's something that you can never give back to someone. And the thing is, is that there's all these diseases now, but uh, if you have a a man and a woman who are virgins that get married, they they can have sex 25 times a day, and they're not ever going to get a a disease. Now, they're going to be tired. (laughs) 
They will be tired. But they don't ever have to worry about sexually transmitted diseases. This stuff is real. It's real. It's in, it's in, it's, it is affecting the church. It's in the church. We have people that deal with these type of problems. And we've got to be able to tell them what the Word says about this. I, I, I said this in the first service. If you can't possess your body while you're single, what's going to make you think you can possess your body after you get married? Because I'm going to tell you, temptation still comes even after you get married. There is still lust that has to be dealt with. There is, you know, thoughts that are there. There's the, the if there's possibility of relationships before. You know, when you get married, there's not this little checklist that Satan has that he checks you off and say, okay, I'm not messing with them anymore. I'm not going to try to mess their life up because they're married now and they can't be touched. Because I can tell you, before you get married, the enemy is hot on your heels trying to get you to, to have sex before you get married. And then once you get married after that, he's trying to get you not to have sex. Because both of those destroy your life. I'm trying. I'm really trying. In the Message Bible, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 5 says this, God wants you to live a pure life. Keep yourselves from sexual promiscuity. Learn to appreciate and give dignity to your body, not abusing it as is so common among those who know nothing of God. Let me, let me say something to you. I am not a prude. If you know, if some of you don't know me, you're, you're new today, this is your first time. Some of you have been here the whole six months that we've been here. You may not know me, but I am not a prude. I am not one of those old line preachers that everything is a sin. Don't you look at the wall wrong? That's a sin. <laughs> I mean, everything was a sin at one time. I mean, you couldn't breathe and it not be a sin. So this is not some archaic message from the Stone Ages. This is a message from the Word of God. We either believe this and we're going to live by this, or we need to shut the doors here and sell this property and do something else. Amen. Because I want, to, I want to lift up this standard. This is the standard that I want us to strive for. I, I, don't, I don't want a low standard that everybody can step on and step over. I want something that's up here that says, you know what? You can live at this level. You don't have to live down here at this level. Matter of fact, you can live up here at this level. You don't have to live at the lower base level of humanity. And you don't have to let your emotions and... and I, I'm not a dog. We're not animals. We have the ability... To, to, to constrain ourselves. And if the Holy Spirit lives in you, you have even more help than other people do not. So you can live a life of sexual purity. Now let me go a little bit on a rabbit trail here for parents. How many parents do I have here today? You are much more on it today than the first one. The first one was kind of like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a parent. Do you know that every, or just about every research that has been done on this topic about sex and sexuality, teenagers have been polled and overwhelmingly the opinion of their parents is what they, is what they value more than anybody else. They value the opinion of their parents. Now when they're with their friends, they're probably not going to stand up in the midst of while their friends are all talking and go, my mom and dad said sex outside of marriage is wrong. <laughs> Your kid will not have a friend again if you let him do that. So, <laughs> so what, what did we used to do? We just didn't say anything or we laughed about the, the, the joke or laughed about what was because we didn't want to stick out. So, but your kids really want to know what you think. Well, the question is, then why don't parents talk about sex to their kids? Here's your answer. Because Satan has so duped them and lied to them into believing that they don't have a right because of the mistakes they made previously before they got married. That's why we feel like, well, 
you know, I don't have a right to speak to them. I, I messed up. I had sex before marriage. Well, let me help every parent in here with this. Romans 8 and 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but after the Spirit. So let me tell you, parents, don't allow the enemy to throw your past in your face because according to Scripture, I don't have a past. Therefore, I, my kids have a future, and I'm speaking into that future. So you don't let the enemy tell you you can't talk about being a virgin and you can't, you can't be pure and not having sex before marriage, even if you didn't do it. Because Jesus bought and purchased you. He bought, the Bible says, my body is not my own. And so you are able to speak into your kid's life. Be real, be honest, be forthright, but you speak into their life. And you don't let the enemy tell you anything otherwise. Ephesians 5 verses 3 through 5 says this, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. That means you don't pop off and say things about the opposite sex and make rude comments. Hey, I've, I've walked with Courtney, and I've, I, she's been out in front of me a little bit, and I've watched the young men walk, walking by. I know what they're thinking. And I don't purposely walk a little behind her, so if they say something, I've got something I'm going to say. I'm ready. I'm ready. I may be wearing pink today, but I'm okay. <laughs> Javier got on pink on. I got something I'm going to say. If he pops off and says something, I'm gonna, we're going to have a nice little come to Jesus quick meeting. I mean, it says, for, this, for of this you can be sure. No, listen, no immoral... No impure or greedy person, such a man as is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You can lose the ability to reap the harvest of the kingdom of God because of sexual immorality. It says don't even let a, there be a hint of it. That, those are strong words. We, have, we had a movie come out, I think it was last year, year before last, year before last called Friends with Benefits. And we go watch stuff like that. I can't go there because I'll make you feel like I hate movies. And I don't hate movies. I love movies. That's why we have men's movie night. But that, that whole movie is about two friends that are tired of trying to date people and all the complications of dating. But when they have the urge to merge, they're going to come together. Friends with Benefits. And then we have terminology today like safe sex and casual sex. Listen, there is nothing casual about sex. Because when that happens, your body, soul, heart, and spirit are all affected. This is, this is, this is what happens when that takes place. When, when there is a man and a woman that come together, and they have that, 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 that meeting, we'll just call it a meeting, and then they decide, well, we don't want to date each other anymore. Here's what happens. It's, it's like taking a piece of paper and another piece of paper and putting Elmer's glue all over that paper, putting that second piece of paper on there and letting that dry for about a week and then coming back and thinking, I'm going to pull the two of those apart and nothing is going to happen. Do you know what's going to happen? It's going to be tore apart. And that's what happens when people, because they come together in that sexual union, there is a soul tie that you, man, you are, you are tied to that person. You don't want to be tied to a person that you're not going to live the rest of your life with and have to deal with all the things that the enemy is going to throw. Because listen, this is how the enemy does it. When you, are, when you have those, those relationships before you get married, and then once you get married and life gets a little rough, the enemy comes knocking on your door and says, you know, you probably shouldn't have married this one because remember how good it was when y'all were together? That's how, that's how the enemy works. He is a liar. The Bible says he is the father of lies. Everything he says is a lie. Everything he says is a lie. 
Sexual purity is a part of the covenant that we make with God when we give our life to Christ. Romans 12 and 1 says we dedicate our bodies unto God. Romans 12 and 2 says that we renew our mind every day so that we remind our body, you are owned by God. Romans 6 and 23 says sin has wages. In other words, sin has a payday. And that pay is guilt, it's shame, it's condemnation, it's feeling dirty, it's embarrassment. And that's not supposed to happen because our sexuality is a gift from God. It's a gift. And how you handle the gift doesn't say so much about the gift as it says about what you think about the person that gave you the gift. If someone was to give you a gift, or say you went out and you bought a gift for somebody and you handed it to them, and they just kind of chunked it. Well, that says more about what they think about you even than what they think about the gift. And so when God gives us this gift and we just kind of chunk it to the side, it says much more about how we feel about our Father than we do about the actual gift. So let me give you five things quickly how to stay pure in your sexual life. If you're here today I, I, and, and you may be involved in something, I pray this will help you today to get out of that. Number one, you need to know and speak the Word of God over your life. You have to know and you have to speak the Word of God over your life. Because Psalms 1, 19, 11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Uh, David also said in the, in the book of Psalms, and he said, I made a covenant with my eyes. So you're going to have to know the Word of God and speak the Word of God so when things come at you, you can know what to say. You may have to be like Joseph, and you may have to run. Feet don't fail me now. I mean, you may have to have track shoes on to get out of that place. I mean, he, he ran from, from Potiphar's wife. And you may have to run. You may have to leave a place. You may have to run from an establishment. You may have to run away from a relationship. You may have to run away from a particular opportunity. But you may have to run. But you need to make a covenant with your eyes. I'm not going to look at certain things. My ears, I'm not going to listen to certain things. My mouth, I'm not going to say certain things. And Father, put, put a guard around my mind, my thought, my dreams, my imaginations. Help me to keep a pure thought life. And when it goes south, let the Holy Spirit jerk a knot in my chain so I can repent and not keep doing that. Because when you dwell on it, and you dwell on it, and you dwell on it, and you think about it, and you role play it in your mind, the enemy is going to make sure one day that he gives you a place where you can act it out. Number two, don't go watch the submarine races. When I was in high school, we lived around Lake Texoma. So when people would go out on dates in the evening after they watched the movie or they went to eat, we went and watched, they, they, they went and watched. <laughs> Jesus. We can cut that out. <laughs> they went and watched the submarine races, which is... They went, they parked, because submarine races are underneath the water, you can't see the races, so you just figure out something to do while you're there in a dark place. It's called parking. Okay, I'm trying to help you. It's called parking. Don't park. Don't, don't get off alone and don't get in a place where Satan works. He works in the dark. Go to the mall at 3 o'clock and try to do that. Go somewhere. I've encouraged Courtney and Tyler both. When you date, date with a lot of people around you so that you can go out and you can be yourself and then also you can see that person and know what they're really like. Because when you get together and you're dating one another in the beginning, you're not really you. You're not you. You're kind. You're sweet. You're smart. 
I is important. Yeah, I know. I know where some of y'all are going. And look, ladies, I've said it before, and I'm just going to reiterate it again. If you are out on, with a guy and he's belching, and he's got other bodily functions going on, get up, call somebody, and tell them to come get you because you're not going to go out with some retard. I was, that's the wrong word. Sorry, sorry. That's a bad word. I, I, I don't know where that came from. Father, in Jesus' name. That's from watching too much TV and hearing too many other words. But that guy, is, he is a, he's a nut. Don't date, don't date someone like that. Don't sit there and have to listen to that. You need to think more of yourself. If you're walking out to the car and he doesn't open the door, go back in. Chivalry is not dead. Manners are not dead. Go out with a guy that has a vocabulary that's bigger than, uh huh. Yeah. What? I'm trying to help you. Number three, don't feed the beast. That's your sexual drive. Romans 12 and 2 out of the message says, don't be, now listen to this, you need to really listen to this because this is out of the message translation. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and then quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, which is always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. That is an incredible scripture in Romans 12, 2, out of the Message Bible. Because it's telling you, don't be conformed to the culture. The culture is telling us one thing about sex and about uh, sexual promiscuity. I mean, they're, they're handing out things in school to say, well, we know you're going to have sex, so you need to have these anyway. What you're telling me is that we are, we are telling our kids, you're nothing more than animals. And the Bible says that we were made a little lower than God. I was made in His image. I, I, I am not from the, 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 the animal race. I'm from God. I'm made in His image and His likeness. And I don't have to give in to these lustful desires. And you know, we all came from the Adams family. Everybody understand that? So we all came, and when he sinned, yes, I know that we have that Adamic nature in us and that, that, that flesh part of us, but when we give our life to Christ, it says now Christ lives in us the hope of glory. Now we have the ability to both crucify our flesh and renew our mind. We can do that. We can do that. Number, number four, guard and watch your thoughts. Proverbs 23 and 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And I'll put it this way, as a man thinks in his heart, so will he do. So will he do. You need to guard your thoughts, guard your imaginations, guard what you meditate on. And then number five is discipline. 1 Corinthians 9 and 27 says in the New King James Version, but I discipline my body, I bring it under subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And let me read it to you out of the Living Bible. Like an athlete, I punish my body. How many of you were in athletics at any time and you realize what that means? That means that's that discipline. That's been going past. Those coaches would push you past that. He said, so like an athlete, I'd punish my body and I would treat it roughly, training it to do what it should, not what it wants to do. Otherwise, I fear that after enlisting others for the race, I myself might be declared unfit in order to stand aside. In other words, my life affects other people. And if I have been witnessing to people and I've been bringing people to church and I've been sharing about the goodness of God, but yet I'm, I, the enemy is, has wrecked my life because of the lack of sexual purity, 
then once those people find out, in other words, it has a, it has a, a, a damning effect. It has a negative effect on their life. And so we, we have to be careful. I, you know, preachers live in a, in a glass house, and we pretty much understand that. My kids live in a glass house. My wife lives in a glass house. My dog, if I had a dog, he'd be living in a glass house. But I want to say this to you. If you love God, and God is, 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 is a part of your life, you live in a glass house, and people are watching you, and people are listening to you, and they're, they're taking in everything that you say. There is, there is something about when you let these words out of your mouth, I'm a Christian, that big radars go on top of people's heads, and they are listening, and they are looking, and they are watching, and they are recording everything about us. So it's telling you right here, discipline your body to do what it's, not what it wants to do, but what it should do. Your life has a ripple effect. It's like dropping the proverbial rock in the water and the, and the little ripple starts out small, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And our life has a ripple effect. 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 says that those that live in sexual perversion, sex outside of marriage, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm here to tell you today, you can be free to live a life of purity. We can live a life that is pure before the Lord. If you're single, if you're divorced and want to remarry, if you are, uh, you know, you had a spouse that's gone on before you and you want to remarry, you can live a life of purity. And I want to say this to you as well. You that are here today that are married, you can live a life of purity. We can live a life of purity. I want you to bow your heads. Father, come to you in Jesus' name today. Thank you, uh, Lord, for speaking through me a very probably touchy and tough subject. But, Lord, it's in your word, and you wrote it to Christians because they were struggling with these areas. That's why it's in the word, because they were struggling. Even back then, they were struggling with, with sexual purity. And so, Father, I thank you today that you, you've already begun to touch people's lives. And you begin to speak into people's hearts and people's lives. And I want to thank you for that today. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask with your, your heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm, I'm going to ask kind of, it's kind of a difficult question, but it's a needed question today. You know, I, I don't know where life has brought you to. I don't know what you've gone through. But I know for the Lord to lay something like this on my heart, there's people dealing with this. And so whether you're single, whether you are divorced, whether you um, are a widower, or whether you're married, this living a life that is pure in context with our sexuality, th the world has made it very tough, and they've made it very hard, made it extremely, extremely difficult on our young people. And so this is what I want to ask today. I... I my last thing I want to do, the last thing I want to do is embarrass anybody. And uh, I, I would never want to do that to you. So I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but I am going to ask you to stand where you're at. If you're dealing, if you're dealing with anything that I've talked about today, I just want you to stand up where you're at because I want to pray over you. And I want to see God do a new work in your life. Listen to me. You are not dirty. You are not dirty, you are not weird, you are not hopeless, you are not, uh, you know, God cannot use you, but God wants to deliver you today. And I'm going to believe that when I pray over you, that the Spirit of God is going to push out a lot of what the world has shoved down at your throat. And that you're going to be able to fight what Paul said is the good fight of faith. A good fight is a fight that we win. It's a fight that we win. Is there anybody else? Because I know the Lord wants to do a good work in you today. Please don't be embarrassed. I, I'm not going to ever think anything different about you. Because I love you. And, and I want you to be completely restored. Spirit, soul, and body. Mind, will, and emotions. It could be pornography. It could be something that has, has happened in a, a former relationship. 
And I realize there may be some people here today that things were forced on you. And it wasn't a relationship. And God may need to just begin to do a healing there. Let Him start today and let Him heal you. Let Him, let him touch you in a way that, that I cannot. Nobody can. But God wants to bring deliverance today. He wants to touch you in a way that nobody else can. He wants to love on you in a way that nobody else can. But I'm encouraging you to stand so you can walk out of here free. There's nothing like being free. Jesus said He's come to set us free. And those that are free are free indeed. In other words, I'm not going to have to carry this ball and chain around with me anymore. I want to encourage you to stand up. Stand up where you're at and let's pray. Let's be real about this today. I know this is an uncomfortable subject. It's uncomfortable for me to preach it. But I'm not going to stand before the Lord when He's put something on my heart and not talk to you. That's not being a good pastor. Anybody else? Before I pray. Father, I extend my hands to these men and women who are standing today. Lord, you know the past of their life. And I would dare say that the enemy has beat them up black and blue. There's been things that they've willingly done, unwillingly done, things that the enemy has, what was once a little bitty crack in the door is now like a gaping hole in their life. And it seems like just the flood of the enemy is in. But Lord, you said you lift up a standard. You lift up a standard when the enemy comes in. And Father, I'm asking you to become the flood in their life today. Wash them clean. Lord, I pray that they're broken. I pray that they're not just, Father, sorry. I I pray they're broken so that the Holy Spirit can do a new work in them today. And Father, whatever it is, pornography, sexual promiscuity, Father, whatever it is in their life today, I'm th- I thank you, I thank you that they're here today, that they would stand up and say, I battle this, Pastor Mark. I deal with this on a daily basis. I need the help of my God who made me to cleanse me, to wash me, and to give me the strength, to give me the strength to push past this and to walk in a purity that I've never known in my life. And so, Father, I thank you for doing that today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Still want you to keep your head bowed and eye closed, eyes closed. I just want to say this to you today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving me a little more time with this particular subject. And I know I've, I've talked on a topic that's probably not mentioned much in church. But I know God is able to take the message that is preached and reach into the heart and lives of people here and change them. And so I want to ask today, I want to be able to pray for two specific people today. One is for the person that says, Pastor Mark, I've never given my life to Christ. I've never prayed a prayer that sounds something like this. Jesus, come into my heart. Rule and reign in righteousness. I'm yours forever. I've never prayed that prayer. That may be you here today. Or there may be someone here today that says, Pastor Mark, I'm in church when things are bad because I pray and need God's help. But when things get good, I slip out. I'm not, I'm not faithful. You know, my, my, my relationship with God is hot and cold. Hot and cold. Hot and cold. And I want it to be hot at all times. And so maybe... The, Today is your day just to come back and say, I'm back. And Father, take me back. And I want to stay in. I don't want to ever get out again. So if that's you, if that's one of those two that describes you, would you just lift your hand so we can see you and know who you are? Come on, there's nothing to be ashamed of. We're not, we're, we're not going to, we're, we're glad that you would lift your hand. We're, we're going to pray for you. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Anyone else? Today is a good day for you to be here. It's a good day for God to do a work in your life. Now here's what I'm going to ask. And I know this takes a little bit of energy. takes a little bit of effort. 
But if you've raised your hand to give your life to Christ for the first time or rededicate your life, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to ask you to get out from behind the chairs. And I'm going to ask you to come down here to the front and let me pray over you. And let us celebrate with you what you're allowing God to do in your life today. Come on, guys. Will you do that for me? Bless you. Bless you, guys. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Guys, turn around this way. Turn around and look at me. Bless you. You turn around and look at me. Now, I've been here six months, and I've never had this many young men come forward. So I just want to tell you, God wants to do something special in your life. He doesn't want you racked with all the things that other people have to deal with. And I just sense, and I don't know you, but I sense some, that God wants to do something really great with you. And I've never said that to anybody that's ever come up. Not that God doesn't want to do great things with all of us, but I just met Greg today. Greg's just been coming to the church just a couple of weeks, was here years ago and coming back. And so I'm just telling you, God is at work among us. And he's at work in these guys' lives. There were other people that lifted your hand. And I want to say to all of you that lifted your hand that didn't come forward, make sure you tell somebody today about the decision that you made in your seat. Because that's where it all starts. If you walk out of here or you take three or four days and you don't share that with somebody, the enemy's going to come in and he's going to rob you. So what I want you to do is take the hands of the person next to you and I'm going to pray over you. Father, in Jesus' name, Thank you so much for these 10 people that came forward and for the others out here that lifted up their hands and said, I need Christ or that I'm rededicating my life to Christ. Thank you for these young men. Thank you for young men. Father, I'm not discounting the others that are here, but thank you for young men, young men that will lead us one day who are older. Father, do a work in their life that's beyond anything they could ask or imagine according to your power that is at work within them. Father, I pray you seal in the lives of the people today as they lifted their hand for salvation, for rededication. May their lives never be the same from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you guys to follow me over here. All of you, come follow me. They're going to take you in here. They're going to pray with you just a little bit more. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Come on, Grace. Let's welcome them. Thank you. And like I said, there were others that lifted their hands. So there was more than 10 people who gave their life to Christ today and who re rededicated their life to Christ today. Grace, there is something truly wonderful happening here at our church. It's not me and it's not you. It is Him. It, I'm not trying to take somebody else's thunder, but it is all about Him. It's all about Him. Come on, will you stand today and let me bless you? Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your people today. Thank you for this great church. Lord, I pray today that you would bless your people and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them. That you lift up your countenance. Give them your great and mighty peace. Father, I pray that your kingdom would come into their lives, your perfect will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, that righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit would be in their lives, that they would be like trees planted by the rivers of living water, that their fruit would be born in all season, that their leaves would never wither, everything that their hands touch would be blessed and prosperous. Father, that they would live continually in the spirit of acceleration and elevation, and Father, that from this day forward, we will live a life that is pure before you, that exalts you, exalts Jesus and the Word, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. Come on, give Jesus praise today.